Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Beginner Series. Today I'm going to cover and really try to do justice to one of the most underrated beginner lizards out there. This is my undying love affair with Berber skinks or Schneider skinks. You'll find them listed as Umisee Schneidery or listed as Novo Umisee Schneidery, although the Novo Umisee seems to have been dropped of late. First described by Dowdin in 1802 as Skinkus Schneidery. We know the Skinkus genus because that's the sandfish skink, which is Skinkus Skinkus Skinkus. It was named in honour of German zoologist, let me get this right, Johann Gottlieb Theoneus Schneider. What a gobful. And subsequently its taxonomic history was thus. It was changed uh, by Isidore St. Hilaire in 1827 to Eumaces pavimentatus, which we'll come back to. Then to, uh, by AMC Dumeril and Bibron in 1839 to Plistiodon Aldro, Aldro Vandi. Uh, and again, um, Plestiodon we will come back to because that and, and the Pavimentanus are mentioned again. Then it was reviewed back to Eumacy Schneidery once more by Boulanger in 1890. And then to Novo Eumacy Schneidery by Griffith in the year 2000. There's five species currently recognised, although these are pretty much invisible to the hobby. Uh, and we, we wouldn't necessarily know if we were keeping them anyway, because to find descriptions of the uh, different subspecies is almost impossible. So there's Eumacy Schneider, Schneideri Barani, first described in 2007, which hails from Anatolia in Turkey. Eumacy Schneideri Pavimentatus, which was mentioned earlier, which was kept as a subspecies name, uh, first uh, listed in 1827. Uh, and it uh, hails from Jordan, Lebanon and Syria and we could probably segue slightly and think well if Pevimentatus was named as the original full uh, Schneidery Schneidery then they must look very very similar and maybe this is a locality thing but they, uh, they, are, they are still featuring as a subspecific name there's uh, Umisi Schneidery Princeps uh, first uh, listed in 1839 from Armenia, Azerbaijan and the Caucasus and then finally um, Umisi Schneideri Zerudni in the year 1900, which hails from Iran, Helmand province in Afghanistan, and the Mekran coastal regions of Pakistan. Uh, Umisi has been under a major taxonomic review, and many species that were once thought to be Umisi have subsequently been reclassified and moved out to other genera. So, Pleistiodon, which we said we would come back to, as previous animals previously listed in uh, Umisis have been moved to Pleistiodon, and these are skinks which hail from Mexico, USA, Canada, and Japan. Japan being the odd one there, maybe there could well be more work to be done, who knows? I mean, I'm not a taxonomist. Yorilepis, which are called Thal skinks, and they're from the Indian subcontinent, and then Mesoskinkus, which occur in Mexico. So the only animals that remained in Eumaces with this reclassification when it's been going on are the animals of what they call the Schneideri group. And these would include uh, Eumaces algirensis, which hails from Morocco and Algeria. These are a super cool skink. They're like a Berber on steroids. They're tanks, heavy set. And with the standardized patination that we've got here, let's just have a look at you, my love. These oranges, also in between, we're gonna get uh, occasional white half moons throughout this as well a much sort of darker steely colored face and quite a darker eye aspect as well gives them a somewhat more of an angry look but altogether a bigger big built skink so that's Eumaces algirensis if you see them jump on them because you won't get the chance again Blythianus is another species which you're never going to see incredibly rare Afghanistan and the Punjab uh, Cholistiensis no details given whatsoever and finally, Eumaces persicus. Again, no details given, but Eumaces persicus, Persia. We've got other animals that have got the Latin name, such as Zemenis persicus, which is the Persian rat snake. So Iraq and Iran, we're assuming that sort of region. The listed geographic range for Berbers is extensive and includes, and I need to look at my list again, so bear with me, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Dagestan, Russia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, 
Azerbaijan, Georgia, Northern Pakistan, and Northwest India. Whew. Look how cool it is. These lizards are ace. Adult size is given at 45 centimeters or 18 inches. Males are large built and, and more impressive, certainly with their heads, very heavy set. There lies the rub. Sexual identifiers on older animals are relatively straightforward. The issue lies with younger animals where the sexual dimorphism has not yet manifested itself. So the males end up with a much larger cranium in all dimensions, much bigger uh, and heavier built. They're gonna be the longest animals approaching the 18 inches. The females are probably a full sort of five to 10 centimeters shorter. And they've got a far shorter snout and a much more slight head. The females, particularly in breeding condition, will develop jowls in the throat, similar to the ones that we see in Felsuma, uh, day geckos, and uh, certain other true geckos like the tokes, where we get these quite large throat lumps. Now, whether they are endolymphatic calcium sacs, I can't specify. All I know is they carry weight in the throat, similar to an adult male tegu. So, yeah, breeding, nightmare, here we go. This is the problem. Berber skinks, absolutely wonderful species. For me, a 10 out of 10 lizard in pretty much every aspect of care, whether that's temperament, territoriality, appetite, adult size, the works. These guys have got the lot. The problem is, can we hellers like get them to breed regularly? And they are hugely problematic. When I was 14 years old, I had a pair of Berber skinks, a female called Freddy and a male called Chunk. Uh, you know, truffle shuffle and all that. So. They were the loves of my life. They're absolutely wonderful. I got them as adults. They live for another, I don't know, God, it must have been another 10 or 12 years as adults. So we can assume that they're going to live to between 20, 25 years easily. Um, I managed to get breeding uh, activity and I managed to get infertile eggs once and I never managed to repeat the feat. My knowledge of the animals back then was relatively low. I was keen, but I was a kid. The technology was uh, not what it is today, and therefore it all just kind of paled into, I had other things going on, and I never tried or had the chance to try and repeat that process again. Hello. Come on then, you're being ever so good, aren't you? So, uh, we've then had, uh, w with the shop, we had a wonderful couple called Ryan and Rachel, who used to come in regularly, uh, and they kept uh, a pair of Berbers that came in as imports from the shop and they were lucky enough to have some success. So I uh, contacted them and asked for a um, record, uh, any notes that could be helpful for this video because simply I've never produced the eggs. So I was sent this. The first year we managed to trigger breeding near the end of May. With the increase in daylight hours and overall temps, eggs were laid 12th of July. We incubated these as you would for a bearded dragon on the moist, moisture mix vermiculite such as 3 to 1. Unfortunately within two weeks all five eggs had gone. Second year we tried incubation with a drier medium. An increase in temperatures within the vivarium around mid-April and five eggs were laid on the 10th of June. Two were shown to be dud within the first week. The final three hatched 51 days later and I'm sure the ratio was 4 to one and we just checked them and to add some moisture if we thought that they were looking particularly dry uh, temperature of incubation you're not going down there come on temperature of incubation was around 85 Fahrenheit we kept them in their own incubator away from the gecko eggs Ryan and Rachel used to breed a lot of uh, crested geckos uh, so I could control the humidity and temp more the first laying, oh, for laying the first time we used a nest box with moist sand because they were on a deep aspen bedding, but the second time they were on sand anyway. And although she had a nest box with moist sand and one with the bark mixed stuff, she actually laid them in the stone hide, which was under the heat lamp, but was around 85 to 90 degrees inside. So that's what I based the incubator at. Three hatchlings resulted and they were sold through the shop and shown to grow as normal. Growth rate was slow, but steady. So now we need to really come on to diet. The diet is um, incredibly varied. These are true omnivores. Um, they will eat a range of eggs, snails, worms, um, the wet cat or dog foods, although that's a treat, but excellent for raising animals of fresh import, maybe a little diet, dehydrated, underweight, and you want to gain weight quick. Um, and then they will also take salads and fruits as well. 
so they will take the full gambit and we can also mix up our diets so i spoke to uh dr mark webb who breeds blue tongue skinks and is lucky enough to have some of the algeriensis that he works with and i mentioned about the slow growth rate on the berber skinks as experienced with the captive bred babies and he said well probably the lack of protein and it's all upside down if you just do it with live foods so with my blue tongues and things i tend to have a mixing bowl i freeze dry i uh, sorry i freeze all of my live foods i then do frost uh, like take uh, loose amounts of crickets or locusts out or mealworms out put them in a bowl chop up some salad crack an egg over the top stir it all together in it goes as a big sloppy mess and they all eat he says this is a marvelous way to be able to communally keep the lizards without there being any territory disputes or freeding frenzies which will include tails and legs going missing because they're chasing after crickets and locusts and uh, misjudged a limb from a cage mate as being a food source so I thought those were excellent notes and uh, definitely would help bring on the size and with the extra protein with the egg and all the rest of it. And you can mix in some of the offals at heart, kidneys, which are D3 rich as well as part of a balanced diet. The dog food and cat food really are just to try and get condition on them when they first arrive and we should try and taper off from that. They will also take occasional pinky mice. Um, also, on top of the breeding notes that I gave earlier, I was looking for some uh, like paperwork on them and it's it's really hard to find really good information but there was a wild study conducted by a gentleman called Stephen Goldberg of Whitler College or University California uh, and they suggested that sexual synchrony in spring uh, with examples peaking in March, April and May. Now that ties in with what Ryan and Rachel gave us which was a May date and I think the other one was a June date um, and they also they are considered to be monoestrous, which means only one clutch per year. So that might give way to some of the frustrations that myself, Ryan and Rachel have felt over the years, because if you miss it, you've missed it, and you need to wait until the next year. Monoestrous means we're only gonna have a single litter, so you're not gonna get multiple chances, and part of our frustration is obviously brought out of the fact that many lizards are polyestrous, or have many seasons per year, well, many heated, uh, cycles or egg producing cycles per season so you know th this animal isn't without its complications and it's the reproductive complications that causes issues as far as husbandry goes and care this is an imported lizard this is an animal that was in the wild we don't want that to continue it isn't um, conducive to an ethical um, hobby we have no choice currently because the, if you want Berber skinks, they're, they're, they're imported. Um, they are wonderful lizards. We need to start captive breeding them and working them out. I have tried to tie together as many clues and give you as many little bits of info as I could get to try and set you on with your project. You will not find a lizard that is more personable, friendly, full of personality, take such a wide range of um, foods, will absolutely just become one of the loves of your life. They are so wonderful and gentle. I can't honestly, my heart, I just, I love them to bits. They're fabulous. As far as care goes, we're gonna keep them probably in a three foot, maybe a four foot viv with a basking area approaching 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. This would be controlled via a dimming thermostat and we would have them cool right off at night. They could go down to about 22 degrees. So jet preferably would have a day night cycling unit. Also UV, because these animals in the past and this is part of the reason why I probably never bred them. We didn't used to keep them under UV for the simple reason that they had such a wide ranging diet that the D3 was there in different measures anyway. And they didn't seem to suffer because they ate vertebrate prey as part of their natural diet. And they got the vitamin D3 required through the um, renal system of the prey items that they were digesting. Modern husbandry, modern reptile care, these need super high UV lights, mega high UV exposure. This will help to be able to set circadian rhythms, be able to control the season, to be able to cycle them more correctly for breeding. These are all things that potentially, you know, I didn't do when I was younger, but that's the hobby develops and I'd rather be honest about it than lie and, and give you a load of BS and flannel because it's not going to get anywhere anyway, anybody anywhere. So you know, a dry, loose, shifting substrate, soil and sand mix, 
sand or even lignocell it's loose and shifting so they can bury away and they will swim through the substrate quite happily um, I've never found that I needed to use any additional humidity treatments they just seem to shed it seems to roll off and you find like a bar of clumped skin it comes off without any issues any residual uh, skin left on the toes will literally just flake away like fish scales it's 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 a, a pleasure to work with by comparison to the wafer thin stuck on skin of geckos and things so yeah absolutely fantastic look them up you may see schneidery do not sleep on them this honestly we need diversity back in this hobby it isn't just all about beardies leopard geckos and cresties we need to try and get the interest going in species like this try and get uh, established pairs so that we can get breeding projects going where we're going to produce more of these animals captive bred animals that we can bring on and each subsequent generation seems to become easier and easier to get to breed and why would this species be any different once we learn what the seasonal cues are we're golden i hope you enjoyed the videos i hope that i didn't go on too long about my love affair with berber skinks but they really are one of the greatest lizards out there so get on it we'll see you soon from Chaz and paul at snakes and adders peace